If I'm going to fall, I don't want to fall back on anything except my faith. Those times of hopelessness, those times when you look in the mirror and you feel like you're a failure, there's times when you feel like you just want to give up. But I promise you this, somehow, some way, it's going to be okay. I'm up here to say thank you to God for giving me this ability, for blessing me, for shaping me, for chastising me, for teaching me, for punishing me, for allowing me to be a vessel and touch people around the world. So keep working, keep striving, never give up, fall down seven times, get up eight. Without commitment, you'll never start. But more importantly, without consistency, you'll never finish. True desire in the heart for anything good is God's proof to you sent beforehand to indicate that it's yours already. That itch that you have to be whatever it is you want to be. That itch, that desire for good is God's proof to you sent already to indicate that it's yours. You already have it. Claim it. Understand this. Understand this also. You have these dreams. Dreams without goals remain dreams, just dreams, and ultimately fuel disappointment. Dreams without goals, yearly goals, life goals, daily goals, monthly goals, hourly goals, minute by minute goals. Dreams without goals are just dreams, and they ultimately fuel disappointment. Goals on the road to achievement cannot be achieved without discipline and consistency. You understand? Between goals and achievement are discipline and consistency. When we live a faith-driven life, I expand my vision of doing things beyond my comfort zone. See, every time that something really happened to me in my life, I didn't know what was going to happen, and I just had to step out in faith. If I had to see everything before it happened, it never really happened. Where you are is where you're supposed to be. And by moving forward, the strength of your faith will unleash power of the Creator in your life. Find some cause that you believe in. What is it that you would like to give the planet? What kind of legacy do I want to leave? What kind of statement do you want to make with your life? What three things you want said when you die? What contribution do you want to make? I don't know what you want to do. I don't know what you want to achieve with your life. Here's what I know about you. That you have greatness within you. That you have things and gifts and talents that you've been bestowed with. That as you work consciously, to cultivate and bring them out and develop a sense of purpose in knowing that your life can make a difference. Decide to make and leave a legacy with your life. I say to you that the planet will never be the same again because you showed up. And the result of an event has no impact on you. Both ways you blissed out. You are a success. When the fruit of… when the fruit of the action does not determine how you are, it's just that you do things because of the exuberance of what you do, then you are a success. The result may depend on variety of things. Results are not always yours. Results… for any result to happen, whether it's in a game or in life situations, there are various factors involved, not all of it is in our control. But what is in our control is either we did our best or we did not do our best. That's in our control. As long as we're doing that and whatever the result may be, if you are still blissed out, that means you are a success because life cannot defeat you anymore.
a bit of a look at yourself and think about what's not so good that you could improve, that you should improve by your own standards and that you would improve, you know, and set yourself a little goal. Um, you know, maybe you're not studying at all at, at any your university, or maybe you're maybe you're at work and you've got this stack of paper there, you know, and you haven't looked at that damn stack for like a month, and you know that you should be, and you're bo bothering yourself at night because you're avoiding that. It's like maybe think, well, I've avoided that stack of paper completely for one month. I'm quite a coward when it comes to whatever snakes might be hidden in that stack of paper. How about tomorrow? I just like put that stack of paper in front of me on my desk and I like, I glance through it for 15 seconds. See if I can do that. It's like, well, you set yourself a goal of improvement. You know, it's a humble goal because really are you such a coward that the best that you can bloody well manage after a month of avoidance is 15 seconds of exposure to a stack of paper? You know, it could easily be. You've been avoiding it. So you're obviously afraid of it. And so the situation could be that dismal and dire. And you might think, well, geez, it's no bomb to my ego. It's no, it's, it's no, it's not fostering the, the strength of my ego to recognize myself, someone who could only withstand 15 seconds of exposure to that thing I'm afraid of. And so that's a form of humility too. It's like, there's things you could do to improve, and you know what they are. And there's small steps that you could take that you might take that would put you in that direction. And then the question is, are you big enough to take those small steps? You know, are you capable of grappling with the fact that you're fundamentally flawed to the point where you have to break things down into almost childlike steps in order to manage them? And the answer to that is, yeah, you are. And that's the lot of I don't know if it's a lot of everyone. Most people have things they avoid, you know, and they're afraid of. So I would say to some degree, it's the lot of everyone. People vary in the degree to which they've conquered that. And you do meet people from time to time who are extraordinarily disciplined, but most of the time they've got disciplined in exactly this manner, through slow incremental improvement. And then you challenge yourself. It's like, well, could I do this? That would be better. And you find out and then you think, well, is there something slightly larger and more challenging that I could do that would be better? And, and you try it and you find out. And as you try it and you find out, generally you get better at it and you can take on larger and larger challenges. Money is the equivalent of energy. So you can buy energy with your cash. And the significance about that is if you're frugal and take care of your money and keep a balance, then you always have this energy in your bank account, energy in which you can live. However, obviously, if you waste this energy, then you actually interfere with your own survival. So you don't really want to go out and just throw away your money. And so basically, I really want to show you that this is an important insight into the nature of our own health and our biology and the world we create in this regard. That our biological system, the cells, rely on energy. Without energy, there's no life. So fundamentally, you have an energy budget that gives you life. And in fact, in the body, energy is in coins called called ATP, molecules that represent units of energy. So in fact, biologists refer to ATP as the coin of the realm. The significance of ATP is this, is that ATP molecules are like units of gasoline, like gallon of gas, that are used to fuel our biological processes. So to stay alive, we have to have all this ATP. So there's an ATP account in your body right now. But the question is, how do you use this ATP? And now here's an important fact, that 25% of the total energy in your whole body is used to operate your brain. So all of a sudden you start to recognize that the brain uses energy at the rate of muscles of a marathon runner. So a brain and muscle activity are pretty much the same. And so why is this important? Because as you're using your brain, as you're using your thinking, you are actually using energy. Now why is this relevant? The answer is very simply this.
because the way we've been using our thoughts are not necessarily productive. As a matter of fact, sometimes our investments of our thoughts are actually counterproductive because our thoughts create a reality that we then have to overcome. So basically it says that we must start to become aware of our thoughts. And why is this important? Because thoughts represent units of energy. Every time you have a thought, you use energy. Why this becomes relevant is, if I give you a checkbook for your bank account, you don't go down the street and just write checks to people like, oh, hey, you're a nice looking guy, here's 10 bucks for you, and oh, here, little girl, go out and buy yourself a little car, here's a thousand dollars for you, and you don't give away your money. Why? Because giving away your money is giving away your life. So basically, you become very frugal when you have a checkbook in your hand. Now what I'm trying to tell you is this. You have an energy budget in your body. The energy is what keeps you alive. When you start using energy and writing checks where you get no return from your energy, then it's exactly the same as writing checks out of your bank checkbook and giving away your cash. So why this becomes important is the biology of belief reveals how our thoughts create our reality. And if you start investing in thoughts that are counterproductive, thoughts like fear, or what am I gonna do, and how am I gonna escape this problem, or how's this gonna go wrong, and all these other kinds of thoughts that are negative kinds of thoughts, then realize this, you are actually not just using your energy for having these thoughts, but these thoughts are also what come into your reality. What you focus on with your thoughts, your brain will manifest as reality.